All right, good morning, everybody. Thank you so much uh, for coming. I'm really, uh, I'm really honored. Um, this morning, we're going to be talking about client-side UI. Um, these are this, your client that's, that's running inside the browser, uh, not on the server. And some of you might already be doing this a lot. Somebody, some of you maybe a little. But uh, wherever you fall along that spectrum, you're going to be doing more of it, chances are, as time, time goes on and not less of it. And so I want, my goal here is to share with you some of the ways that I've come to think about clients UIs uh, that can help you build user interfaces that are reactive, that are educational, and ultimately satisfying uh, to your users. What I want to share with you is the power of M. Um, my name is Charles. I'm a Cowboy D on, on GitHub and Twitter. And I work at the front side, where we've been doing um, UI for almost 10 years uh, exclusively. And when I talk about M, of course, I'm talking about M as in MVC. We're all familiar. We've probably heard about uh, the MVC pattern, model view controller. It's what underpins all UIs, uh, at least ostensibly. But it can actually be pretty notoriously difficult to pin down what exactly is uh, MVC. Um, it's a difficult question, and if you ask two people, you're likely to get <laughs> a very different answer. Um, and my, what I'm, uh, I don't want to, to, to go in too much to try and define, give you one uh, particular version uh, of MVC. Um, I think there are many. Um, and in fact, you find people asking the question, is Rails MVC? Um, and some people are really, really stodgy about this. They're Rails MVC, pshaw. Um, I'm more relaxed about it. I say yes, Rails is MVC. It's server-side MVC. It's a flavor of, of uh, MVC. But what I've come to realize is that MVC is it's kind of like kung fu. There's lots of different schools. Uh, there's lots of different ways to, to, to practice, each with its own strengths, each with its own weaknesses. And, you know, which one you choose you need to, uh, uh, is, is, needs to be appropriate for the context. But today we're going to be talking about client-side UI, which is different than, uh, different than, than the server-side MVC. Um, and one of the things that, that really sets it apart is when you're working on the client, you constantly have to manage state. The client's always on. It's not like a Rails application where you're basically setting up the world and then throwing it away with every request. On the client, you're always on. And so you have values that relate to each other. And when one of those values changes, you have to update the, the, the other values uh, to reflect that. So <clears throat> when we're thinking about MVC, I've come to, to realize that really what you want to do is you want to focus on the model. Um, when you first come to the, to the acronym, MVC, Model View Controller, you tend to, to give equal billing to the letters because they're, 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 there's, no one is set apart from uh, in, in the acronym. But I've come to find that while the view and the controller are important, they orbit the model. So I actually draw inspiration from, from this guy. This is Plato. He's one of the ancient software developers. You can actually tell he's got a Chromebook pixel uh, there in his, uh, in his hand. Um, and I think that uh, he made an analogy a long time ago that I think really cleanly captures this concept. He had this allegory of a cave. And the idea is that living in this world is, is like being inside a cave. And back up at the entrance of the cave, where you can't see, there's this fire burning. And shapes pass in front of the fire. And they cast shadows on the wall. And we, inside the, the, the world, the only thing that we can actually see is the shadows. The shapes and the fire are hidden from us. But if we look at the, sh the, the shadows, we can extrapolate those shapes. And the shapes that we see on the wall take their form purely as a function of the shape in front of the fire. They are as they are and are no other way because, because of those true forms and the way that they interact. And so this is all 
this is all very, uh, very abstract. We've covered, you know, who I am. We've covered the, the um, an ancient philosopher, which is, I guess is uh, obligatory. But uh, I really want to give a demonstration of this principle in action uh, so that you can see a little bit more concretely what it is that I'm talking about. And so to do this, we're going to explore the concept of a color. It's a, a, a very simple concept. It's something that most of us can uh, perceive very easily. We, we, we know what it is, but it can be surprisingly difficult uh, to, to pin down. Um, <clears throat> there's many, many, many different ways to represent it, but we're gonna have we're going to have a color, and this is going to serve as the basic value in our system. You can think of it as like an integer value or a string value or, or something like that, and we're going to see how this, when we have this color, what, what, kind of, uh, what kind of reflections we can make on that wall. So the first example is we're just going to, we're just going to project this color onto a single div. We're going to, this, this color value on the right, we're going to be able to set a color remove a color, set a color, and as we do that, the, the swatch, the color swatch will, will update itself. And I actually uh, have a little demo here. And I've got it hard-coded just statically so that when I check this checkbox, the, the swatch will turn green. And I can uncheck it and check it. It's not, not too much, it's, it's simple, but it's uh, surprisingly satisfying. When I was putting this talk together, I actually uh, just sit there and click on, off. It's great. And you can do the same thing. We can actually connect <clears throat> one color to two swatches. So we've got, there's no reason we can't, can't duplicate that. We'll take two of these swatches and, and bind them to the, the, uh, the same color. The, there's, there's so there's only one color in the system, but the effect is the same. Again, I could do that forever. And this is what data binding is. You might hear about data binding, and um, most people kind of equate data binding with templates, because that's usually where we come to it first, right? We change this one value and this string value updates. But templates are really just a special case of data binding. Um, in the abstract, it's really just about uh, taking two values and putting, putting them together so that they occupy the same space uh, in your application. There really is no difference conceptually between them. Um, some, this, is, this is different than observation, uh, which is kind of another pillar on which client-side UIs are built, where you can observe for value changes in a model, and when that value changes, you get a callback. But with data binding, you really need to think of it taking two separate properties and really just making them overlap and becoming the, the absolute, the, the same thing. Now, it is built on observation, so when we have a model and it's got some property, I've got a, one named A and one named B, we can use observers to, uh, to, to implement the data binding so if the, a value appears at A, we observe that and we immediately copy it onto B. And if a value appears on B, then we immediately copy it over into A. But it, I'm showing this, the mechanics of it so that you can forget about them. Because you, when, when we're talking about sound traveling, you don't really want to think about the particles knocking together. What you really want to think about is the data flowing through, just like it's a pipe. And this is good, because it, it, uh, it decouples that data flow from your computation, so you can compose your different models together just by making them overlap at, at well-known points. So to, to, to show this in action, I've got a model here called a desaturator. And on the left, it takes a color, and on the bottom, there's a, a, a value, a real number between 0 and 1, and then the color on the right is a desaturated version of the color on the left. So, and, and that relationship is, it's, it's, a, it's, it's, it's pure. The, the value of that color on the, the right, no matter what the color on the left, is always going to be a desaturated version of that color. So if we see this, we can now plug it into our swatch assembly just using data binding. Um, so let's see that in action. Here's our desaturator. I've got the, the green turned on. And as we up the desaturation, you can see that it literally just sucks the color right out until uh, if you're fully desaturated, you're at gray. Um, if you've ever, never heard the term of uh, 
desaturation before. That's, that's, that's what it is. Um, and of course, uh, if I change it to a different color, in this case, black, which is the absence of color, then they're, they're both black because a desaturated nothing is still nothing. But if I shine the color through again, then the, the desaturation uh, remains. And this is all well and good when it comes to binding colors to colors. But when you've got two separate data types, because remember, you know, bindings can only work on the, the same data type. When you've got two separate data types, what are you going to do? Well, you just need m another model. And in this case, what I've implemented here is what I call a color syntax. And it's a model that's got a color on one end and a string on the other. And I'm, you know, there's a little bit of hand waving in here because this model is a little bit complex on the inside, but from a composability standpoint, it's very simple. It just relates a color and a string. And it goes both ways, so that if a color appears on the top, that implies a string value on the bottom. And if a new string value appears on the bottom, that implies a different color value on the top. And so I can plug this in to our assembly, and I'm going to go ahead and plug it in twice to kind of uh, fast forward and show you a little bit um, more of the power of data binding here. Um, <clears throat> so we've got two text inputs, which produce strings, but they're bound to our color syntaxes, but both color syntaxes are bound to the same color, which is that swatch on the right. So we can see this in, in action here. Where I've got my two, two text fields. And I can change the color of one. We're probably most, we're used to dealing with uh, hex values. And you can see that the, the colors update both in the swatch, uh, the desaturated value of the swatch, um, and also in the other text field. So I can set it to cyan, and then I get a desaturated cyan. Uh, because all I'm really doing is changing that one color value. Um, incidentally, these, uh, these text fields, there's nothing special about the format because the way I implement it as a, a, a color syntax, I actually can take this here um, and, and copy it up here and uh, <clears throat> it will still update the color uh, because the, the syntax is format agnostic. So it doesn't really matter and I can also use an RGB constructor here to make this red again. Um, so. And that's good. You know, we can, we can play around with the colors. We can enter in RGB values here uh, one at a time and see the kind of the effect they have on the mixed color. Uh, but that doesn't give us real insight about the, the, the individual components. So what we can do is we can actually add another model to decompose this color into its RGB values. So we've got, again, we're relating over here on the left a color value and over on the right three different uh, three different coordinates, red, green, and blue. And we can see how those things relate to each other just by binding it into, um, binding it into our application. Now, I've gotten rid of the, the desaturator uh, and, and put this RGB selector in here. So let's see what this ends up looking like. You can see I've got uh, these sliders bound to those RGB values. And I can do things like bring in red so that I've got now a pure yellow and I can fade out the green until I've got my pure red. And so I can see how uh, each individual color affects the, the final value, which is, you know, this is, this is, this is pretty neat. We're, we're starting to, to get um, something of a, of a more non-trivial application. Um, but we still, we're still not seeing how the color is actually constructed by the computer. And to do that, we can use, we can, we can visualize not just the, the final output in that swatch, but we can actually visualize each value for red, green, and blue and how that relates to the original color. So um, what I did was I made an RGB visualization component and bound it to the color so that when the color uh, updated, we visualized not the whole color like the swatch, but the actual uh, different um, red, green, and blue values. And that's what this looks like. You can see we've got 
right here are pure green, but we can bring red in slowly. And you can see how you get that, that yellow there. And then <clears throat> if we bring in blue, how it goes to white. But what we're seeing now is we're actually seeing how the color is added by the, 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 the actual hardware. And RGB is an additive model. We're taking a red value, a green value, and a blue value, and we're adding them together. So that part where all the circles overlap, that's all three colors added together. And then where only two of the circles overlap, those are where the other two circles are, are together. So you can see that if I've got a pure yellow or I've got a pure um, cyan, oops, I've got a pure cyan, you know, I have no, I have no red component. And so the, 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 the swatch or the part in the middle is the, is the exact same as the overlap for uh, green and blue. And so you can kind of play around with this and see how the individual colors mix uh, and not be, not be distracted by the, the, the overall sum. And RGB is a great, RGB is great if you happen to be a pixel. Um, it can be difficult for us to understand RGB. The reason that we use RGB coordinates is because it's very easy for a monitor to take three values, add them together, and be like, that's the frequency of light that I need to emit. But that's not how we as humans actually perceive it. And so there are, um, there are other coordinate systems that are more in tune with the way that we perceive color. Um, which unfortunately we don't actually use. You know, RGB is kind of like the assembly language uh, of color. Um, <clears throat> it's what the machine understands. Um, so probably the most, the other most popular format, the most popular coordinate system for describing color is called HSL, um, and it it stands for hue, saturation, and lightness. I'm going to read briefly uh, what these these mean or what they're defined as. So hue is the degree to which a stimulus can be described as similar to or different from stimuli that are described as red, green, blue, and yellow. Saturation, the colorfulness of a color relative to its own brightness. Uh, lightness, the subjective brightness, perception of a color for humans along a lightness darkness axis. Now, if you're like me, that really, even though it's aimed at me, it's completely and totally incomprehensible. Um, the, 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 the vocabulary definitely is about humans and human perception, but it's still a black box. It's still completely opaque. But what we can do is we can add another model, and we can decompose that to unpack those individual coordinates and see how they affect, our, uh, the, affect the different color values. So let's go ahead and uh, plug that in. I've got an HSL selector, just like I had the RGB selector. And we can see the, the hue, saturation, and lightness coordinates over there on the left. So right now we have a pure green. I can take it down to a pure red. We can move the H. We're going to keep SNL. And you can see as I go to green, the red fades out till I've got a pure green. And then the blue fades in till I've got a pure cyan. Then the green fades out so that we've got a pure blue. And then uh, red fades back into purple. And then blue fades back out to red. I particularly I love, as, I, as you watch the hue, seeing where the RGB sliders are going. And if you, as, so you can see that the hue is going around that color circle. It's going around the color circle. And then as you adjust the saturation, you can see, OK, the red's coming down, and the green and the blue are coming up in unison. And when I fully have zero saturation, then we're at a gray. And if I bring the saturation up, the, the green and blue go down in unison, and we're back to that pure color, that pure hue. So um, I think that this gives a, um, a much better uh, a view on, on these different coordinates. Uh, <clears throat> same thing with lightness. You can see as we go from 0.5 to 1, it's almost like we're just mixing in white until You've got nothing but white. And as we decrease the lightness, you can see those green and the blue come down together. And then, when, then as we go from 0.5 lightness to 0, we're just fading that hue to black. Um, and so I think even though the terminology that you might read on Wikipedia about what HSL is is very opaque, it actually becomes pretty clear uh, about uh, what it is when you, when you can play with the individual coordinates and see how it relates to 
both the, the color at large, the, um, the, uh, uh, and, and also the, the additive color model that the computer is using. Um, and we can also, and we can, we can visualize uh, the HSL uh, by making another visualizer just like we did with the RGB and we can bind it into our color model. I think we've got, what, one, two, three, four, five different things, six different things. Uh, let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven different things uh, bound to this color. So we've got quite a robot we're building here. Um, and so this is, this is actually HSL space, and you might already be familiar with the color selectors that use uh, HSL. You can see that as I adjust the hue here, I'm going around that color wheel. And those, you can see where the color wheel fits on those uh, along, along the points. And the color that's, the color that's selected is, is right down there. Um, this, so what we're seeing here is the hue goes around in a circle. It's an actually a radial component. Uh, so which is why it's from you know, zero to, to 360 in there. And then the saturation, or the intensity of the hue, is the radius of that circle. <clears throat> and then if we look at the lightness here, um, you can see that the lightness, we fade up to white at the top, and then fade down to black there. So as we adjust the, the lightness, we can go, we go up to white at the top and down to black at the bottom. So that's, that's pretty neat. I think, I think there's a lot of power uh, in that um, by taking, you know, just, just, just by binding to a single value. But uh, values, values are actually not just on the client. You can actually treat a server, for example, as a simple model. And so here I'm, we're, we're going to have a server component. And the server is a black box, but from the perspective of the rest of the client, it behaves just like any other model. If a color appears at that point, it's sent into the black box, it can be sent to the server, serialized, whatever, and by the same token, something can happen on the server and it can make a color value appear uh, um, right there. So we can use this concept to develop ColorBook, which is the first social network for color values, <laughs> which I'm about to show you. And we can do this just by plugging in uh, our server <laughs> into our robot. I was actually kind of running out of room uh, so same basic concept. It's a little bit of a snaky cable there. Um, and so now we'll do an actual live demo uh, in here. So I've got, uh, I wrote a little Rails app that uses WebSockets to um, implement those servers, or implement uh, that, the, the, the endpoints on the servers. So we can now open up that example that you saw in two separate tabs. And then uh, we can see them acting in unison here. And so what's actually happening here is I've got two different client-side applications, but they're all bound together. So one of the things that I hope to have demonstrate is that there is actual power in simplicity, that keeping your models simple and keeping them composable. I think that you know, this is probably, in terms of API, this was probably the, the, the most complex model uh, that we had in the system. It's got you know, four points that you can, you can bind to. Uh, <clears throat> but because... You know, because we understand the relationship uh, um, b between them, we can use each one of these individual models, which are very, very simple, to link together in simple ways to make 
uh, a very complex and, and interesting application. And so I shied away from, from actually defining a model because, like I said, I don't want to get into nomenclature wars, but I think it's fair to define a model as just a group of values with well-understood relationships. Values with well-understood relationships. And if we understand those relationships, then we can compose them in very simple and easy ways. But it's actually understanding the relationships that's the hard part. That is where the, the bulk of the work is. Um, and I think that, that, that Plato got that. You know, when he originally made this allegory of the cave, one of the, his goals was to explain to people what exactly a philosopher does, what his job is. The philosopher's job is to look at those pictures, which is the only thing that we can conceive, and from it infer and construct that model or form that's standing in front of the fire. And so when it comes to UI and, and software in general, the philosophy part falls to you. That's your job. Um, it can be very satisfying and, and uh, rewarding. And uh, I hope you have fun with it. Thank you.